Welcome to The Book Show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. Emily St. John Mandel is the award-winning best-selling author of Station Eleven and The Glass Hotel, who returns with a novel of art, time, love, and plague that takes the reader from Vancouver Island in 1912 to a dark colony on the moon 500 years later, unfurling a story of humanity across centuries and space. Emily St. John Mandel's five previous novels include The Lola Quartet, The Singer's Gun, The Glass Hotel, and Station Eleven, which was a finalist for a National Book Award and the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction, and is the basis for the HBO Max series by the same name. The new novel is Sea of Tranquility, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Emily St. John Mandel back to the book show. Thank you so much for being with us. What a great pleasure to have you on the program. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's nice to be here. At what point did this story start to come into your mind and and that you knew that it was going to have such a a large scope? About two or three months before the pandemic, I'd started playing around with fragments of autofiction, which for anybody unfamiliar, that's autobiographical fiction, which I think of as fiction that's maybe just slightly more obviously based on the life of an author because, you know, I think we do inevitably put our personal experiences and proclivities into everything we write. But I'd wanted to write about the experience of the epic book tour, which was something that I went through with Station Eleven. It is an incredible privilege to get to do something like that. You know, it was amazing getting to travel to so many places and talk to so many people. I think it's fair to say that 99% of the interactions I have with people on tour are absolutely positive and wonderful. But man, that 1% is on, it's something else. So <laughs> yeah. I, had, um, I had had some very surreal interactions on the road, and I wanted to write about them. So sometime around, call it November, December 2019, I'd been working on these fragments of text about an author on a very long book tour. And then the pandemic hit. And I would say that that was a surreal and destabilizing moment for me, but it was a surreal and destabilizing moment for literally everybody. You know, I, My memory of the spring of 2020 is we were all a little deranged. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to write a new novel. And I think I need to go for maximum escapism. So how about if there's time travel and moon colonies? I was like, I'm just going to go all in on the weirdness here and just write something really out there. So I started working on Sea of Tranquility. And then I'd realized pretty early on that there would be a time traveling detective in it because that seemed fun, you know, in a moment when everything was terrible, which, you know, for context, we're talking about New York City in March 2020. It was bad. So I had to think, well, what are the time points going to be that this detective is going to visit? I liked the idea of setting something around 1912 when Sea of Tranquility opens because there's a great grandfather of mine I'm kind of interested in. And I based that initial character we meet, Edwin St. Andrew, on him. And then I knew I wanted to write about February 2020 because I'm a little obsessed by that very specific historical moment, which The way I remember it is there was this kind of mass failure of imagination, which is really interesting to me. Just this thing where we knew what was coming. Um, We could see that this terrible new illness was moving rapidly toward us, but we somehow didn't quite believe it in a way that absolutely does not make sense. (laughs) So I, uh, I knew I wanted that as a time point. And then as I started thinking through the far future time points, I thought, well, maybe it would be kind of interesting and cool to take that text I wrote about an author on tour and pass it through a kind of sci-fi filter. So so there you have a, an author figure mm. who's um, who's out on the road in the year 2301. The couple sections in the book directly uh, related to the book tour is called Last Book Tour on Earth 2203. And the author is really struggling because they're well, they're struggling because it's a book tour and they have to be everywhere and they're saying the same thing over and over again. But they're also (laughs) being continually asked over and over again about the coming pandemic uh, Mm -hmm. in 2203 and the author becoming more and more concerned 
wondering what it's going to be like, you know, at what point they're going to have to wrap this up. Yeah, uh, there are ever so subtle elements of autobiography in there, if you hadn't guessed. Um, yeah, that, w- that was a strange part of the early pandemic for me personally, was being asked for a commentary on the COVID-19 pandemic because I wrote Station Eleven. I got a lot of invitations for op-eds and articles and essays about pandemics and as they relate to Station Eleven and COVID-19. I said no to all of them because it felt a little gross, you know, like I was using COVID-19 as a Station Eleven marketing opportunity, which kind of made my skin crawl. And it was just a really odd thing being suddenly held up as an expert, which, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist. I just wrote a novel with a scientifically implausible flu pandemic in it. And that is the extent of my expertise. <laughs> so, yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to capture a bit of that strangeness and sea of tranquility. There, there is, when we look at the group of characters that you introduce us to at the beginning of the novel, in, in the first third or so, uh, that, that these are people that, that are lonely, uh, they are sad, they, they walk around often without purpose, but they do have, they have one shared experience. Talk a little bit of, just about that idea of the loneliness and the sadness that you, that you start with, with those characters. Yeah, absolutely. This book, it's not bleak. I think that there's joy in it in the same way that there's joy in Station Eleven. At the same time, it is absolutely a product of its historical moment. And there was a lot of loneliness and sadness in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. We didn't know how bad it was going to get. And how bad it already was was devastating. You know, that's that's really what I think about remembering that time. So I guess it makes sense, you know, although I didn't really do it consciously, that that is the emotional starting point for a lot of these people. Um, but they do find connections. You know, as you mentioned, they are connected by this anomaly in time and space, which points to the possibility that we're living in a simulation. And they're connected to each other by that and to this time traveling detective who visits each of them in turn. Emily St. John Mandel is our guest. The name of the new novel is Sea of Tranquility. Where did the title come from? How does that fit in? Titles are hard. My, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always just the coolest title I can come up with, if we're being honest here. <laughs> I think the first title the book had was, was Gaspery. That was the title it had when I sent it to my agent. It wasn't quite right. I liked that it was one word, but everybody pronounces it differently, and it's... It's not super catchy. So, right. yeah, I um, Sea of Tranquility, you know, it's, of course, a geological feature on the moon. And it's also just a very elegant phrase. So I thought I'd go with that. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a beautiful title for a, a beautiful novel. Uh, but let's go to Gaspari for a moment, because that is a, a main character in the book. And that was a name I don't think I've ever really come across before. I might have made it up. I was going for something unusual for, <laughs> for a plot point later. But you know what? I just remembered a smarter reason why Sea of Tranquility was the title, which is um, something that I found personally striking as I was parenting a young child in the early days of the pandemic and really working over time to create this incredibly tranquil, as fun as possible space without other kids in it, was just this idea that life can be tranquil in the face of catastrophe. And it was this, it was just a really interesting aspect of that time for me, where, you know, inside our apartment was so tranquil and peaceful, and we had our routines, and it was often nice. And outside was death, you know, like March 2020 in New York, it's it's really hard to overstate how unpleasant that was. So yeah, that was another reason why that word tranquility felt important to me for the title. You know, I asked you the the question about the the loneliness and the despair of the of the characters, and yes, I mean the the novel is far from bleak, and the opposite of that is your descriptions of our world as viewed by different characters at different times. How beautiful it is! Just how gorgeous the the what they are seeing often is. And and that's really a lovely place too of a of a reminder of of not just this country, but of our planetary system. I think so. 
I think it's important to notice the world around us and to notice its beauty. That, that's something that I personally really love about taking pictures. You know, I take a lot of photos on my phone and it's kind of about that, just noticing the beauty of the details of the world. I, I mentioned this in the introduction and this never fails to amaze me about your work, but I, I thought it was especially true with this novel, is that you're writing about time travel. You are writing about metaphysics. The novel is so clean and spare and non-confusing. Oh, thank you. Good. <laughs> that it is, it, that seems, I, I, that just seems so artful to me to be able to bring us to those places. And there's almost, and certainly argue with me uh, about this if you if you need to but it seems like you you do trust the reader to come with you to understand that okay we went there and now we're 200 years ahead here mm -hmm. and sure there could be a lot of questions but let's just deal with what we're dealing with yeah i think you've touched on an important part of my writing philosophy there which comes down to character development my personal feeling as a writer is that if my characters are reasonably well developed, like if you care about them enough to suspend disbelief and feel as if you're spending time in the company of a human being, then I think you'll follow me pretty far as a writer. And you know, that kind of dovetails with something else, which is I have a lot of respect for the intelligence of readers. You know, I don't think that readers need to be spoon-fed all the information. I think you can trust them to figure out what's going on. And, you know, I try not to be obnoxious about it. And that's why in a lot of my work, <laughs> you know, I will try to have signposts of some kind, which to go back to Station Eleven, that was why so many chapters began with lines like 20 years after the end of air travel or two weeks before the end of air travel, just to quickly orient you in time and space before you, before you follow these characters. I, I feel like the, um, the sort of how to put this, I guess the styles or the traditions of literary fiction in terms of, you know, prose style, character development, trying to write with an eye toward elegance. I think those map well onto all the other genres. You know, what the other genres bring is more plot, and that's wonderful mm. and amazing. But also, you can still write, I think, in a very clear way about the human experience and set that experience in a moon colony in the year 2401. So I, I love blending genres together in that way. There is, I guess one of the obvious questions to come out of what you just said is that if you were to write Station Eleven now, would, would, would it be different in the sense of, of that you wouldn't have those guideposts? That's a good question. I would still have the guideposts, but there are things that I would do differently if I were writing Station Eleven now. There are a couple of things in particular. One has to do with, I guess, a uh, unfortunately more firsthand knowledge of pandemics, which we all right. have at this point. And the other has to do with the way this country has changed. So to tackle the first one first, I think that for all my research, I had always thought of being in a pandemic as kind of a binary state, like you're either in a pandemic or out of a pandemic. And it just hadn't occurred to me before living through this pandemic that there is this weird and terrible in-between where risk calculation feels almost impossible. You know, if you're either in a pandemic or out of a pandemic, then what was February 2020? And for that matter, where are we now? You know, it's this really confusing kind of half in half out time so that's something that i think i would have done differently in the rollout of the pandemic in station 11 had that that terrible in between gray area interlude and then the other thing this goes to how much the united states has changed in however long it's been a decade or so since since i was writing that book there's a scene in station 11 where flights are diverted to the nearest airport characters get out into the Severn City Airport in Michigan. People gather below a monitor tuned to CNN, and they all believe everything the newscaster is saying. And I swear to God that was plausible in 2012. <laughs> that, that made sense back then. <laughs> that absolutely in no way maps on to the present political or 
or news media moment that we're yes. in. You know, that, that just that that's not plausible. That's science fiction. <laughs> so that's something to do differently now. Uh, the world's changed. Is that something that you that you noticed, uh, especially on working on the TV adaptation? Well, to tell you the truth, I actually didn't have much to do with that adaptation. It was it was interesting experience. Um, yeah, the Station Eleven adaptation, which, for the record, I'm a huge fan. Um, yeah. I wrote the source material, but had nothing to do with the production. So there was a very early conversation with Patrick Somerville, the showrunner and lead writer on that project, where this would have been back in, I believe, the fall of 2017, where he just acquired the project under the umbrella of Paramount. And he called me and said, you know, I'm really excited about this. If you were interested, there could be a place for you in the writer's room. And in that particular moment of my life, I wasn't really interested in writing for TV. Um, I'm all in now on The Glass Hotel, but at that moment I wasn't. And I was working on The Glass Hotel. So going back to Station Eleven kind of felt like going back in time or something. So yeah, so I said, you know what, I have no idea how to write a screenplay. Like, I trust you, go do your thing. And he did, and what came back was this spectacular series. Um, Something that's interesting about the series is that because there are things that you actually need to just show in television, which you can gloss over in prose in a literary novel, they did have to nail down the timeline. So yeah, in Station Eleven, there's a pandemic in 2020, but it ends the world. It's not COVID-19. And yeah, I, I found that really interesting. You know, it's an interesting thing with Hollywood. I've, I've absorbed all the horror stories. I know that they're real. I have friends with like low level, too much time in Hollywood PTSD <laughs> from dealing with these people. Um, Hollywood is the only place where I've ever had a mentor. And that's really interesting to me. On the one hand, there's the awfulness. On the other hand, there is a community of artists obsessed with building stories together. And that's been the most wonderful thing. So yeah, I've done both too. Um, with Station Eleven, I was like, okay, go do your thing. I'm gonna go cash this check. With the Glass Hotel, I'm taking the opposite approach. I'm commuting back and forth from New York City to Los Angeles all the time. When I'm in Los Angeles, I'm in a writer's room, and it is so much fun. It barely feels like work. When I'm in New York, I'm on Zoom for six hours, which is still fun, but it does feel like work because <laughs> Zoom is terrible. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's been really fun and interesting to get to collaborate with people. I love writing novels, but after the isolation of the pandemic, I've kind of been feeling like, you know what, I don't want to do all my work alone in a room anymore. I want to sit with other people and build stories together. So yeah, it's been a great pleasure in my life over these last few months. Sea of Tranquility is the new novel. It is published by Knopf by Emily St. John Mandel. One of the really key questions of this novel is, especially when it comes to the time traveling aspect, is can you know something and not know something at the same time, right? I mean, that's that's yeah. really what you're, what you're looking at and, and trying to get to. Absolutely. And, you know, as you said that, it made me realize this is the second book in a row where I've considered that question with with the previous book, The Glass Hotel, where every character in that book is fictional, but the crime is, of course, based on Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. Right. That condition of knowing and not knowing felt so relevant to me in terms of that story. And you're right, it does absolutely come into play again in Sea of Tranquility, because although, you know, it is a joyful book, like there's a time traveling cat, just, you know, putting that out there for the audience. Um, <laughs> It is, there is, all, there are also moments in the book where the pandemic's arriving and that takes us back to what I was talking about earlier with February 2020 in New York City. Knowing and simultaneously not knowing that a pandemic was about to hit us like a tsunami. Like that was, yeah, it, it's a very interesting psychological state to me. It also brings you to a point and this goes back a little bit to what we were talking before about uh, the loneliness that we all felt um, at that time, but of of how much also you're aware of what else is going on in the outside world and what you're missing and, and what you're missing in any given time. And these seconds that, that happened off to your right or off to your left, 
that as you investigate in this novel, obviously didn't seem like anything at the moment, but as you go back and you look at them, they had a tremendous impact on the trajectory of your life. Yeah, you know, that's something I think about a lot. Um, these small moments that, that yes, absolutely have a huge trajectory uh, on your life. The reason why Patrick Somerville developed Station Eleven and why we're now developing the Glass Hotel and Sea of Tranquility together is that kind of randomly we did a reading together in Chicago in 2012. <laughs> you know, like, what if I'd picked a different author? My life would be very different and so would Patrick's presumably. So those contingency moments, those kind of branch moments where you picked A instead of B and that set you down the B path, that's something I think about all the time, not just in fiction, but also in life. Knowing where you're going to end up, in this sense, that just the, maybe the last 25, 30 pages of, of how solid you knew uh, part seven, I guess, mm -hmm. um, of how much you knew, because you're looking at 1918, 1990, and 2008, of, of how much you knew of how that was going to wrap things up as you were starting the project. <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing, but that was totally an add-on at the very end. <laughs> so the book has that symmetrical structure, which... This will not come as a surprise to any reader who's read both novels, but structurally, it's absolutely an homage to David Mitchell's novel, Cloud Atlas. So the book marches from 1912 to the far future, then back to 1912. And then there is that final section called Anomaly, which is about a time-space anomaly and is also anomalous to the structure. I'd written the whole book without that section. And I remember just kind of sitting there one night before bed and feeling like the book's missing something. And without spoilers and having this realization about the identity of a character was like, wait, I should do that and then this and then that. And then I went and wrote that the next day. <laughs> but yeah, without that last section, I don't think the book would be that good. I, I'm glad that I thought of it before I went to my publishers. Yeah. So, yes, it is called uh, Anomaly. And so you wrote that quickly then? I did. Yeah. You know, by that point, I was just so immersed in the book that it didn't take that much time to write that last section. And you also, obviously, you have to know your characters very well and know where where they're at to to do something like that. You do, absolutely. Yeah, like that's the kind of thing where, you know, I do write, I usually write out of order. Like I'll write kind of random sections of a book and then figure out how they all go together later. So there is a universe in which I could have written that last section first. If I'd done that, it would have taken me five times longer. But by the end of the project, I just had such a clear sense of who those characters were. So it didn't take much time at all. One of the characters that I, well, I would say the character that I really related to and loved in this book, who comes off not great at the beginning, but, but is just a, a fascinating, lovely, beautiful character, is Zoe. Talk a little bit about Zoe's arc. She is wildly intelligent. She's always known what she wanted to do with her life. And in that particular way, she's the opposite of her brother, Gaspari, who's the protagonist in that section. You know, Gaspari's smart, but he's never had any idea what to do. Zoe's this very driven person. She fell in love once, and it ended tragically. She has a hard time relating to other people. She has a hard time with that thing where when you're really good at something and extremely competent, that can be isolating. So I saw her as somebody who struggles with that a little bit. She really wants to do the right thing, and she will do anything for family. And that's why, you know, she follows Gaspari or lets him lead her down a pretty dangerous road toward the midpoint of the book. I love the idea that there, no matter what time we're talking about, there's there's still that, well, it's timeless, isn't it, of, of a sibling relationship. Yeah, <laughs> of how yeah they I relate. return to that so often. Yeah, so <laughs> how they relate to one mm -hmm. another. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm the second of five. So sibling relationships are really important to my life. And <laughs> it's a topic I've thought about endlessly. You know, I just have personal experience with so many permutations of what that can look like with so many different people. I've got three brothers and a sister. I'm the youngest of, of five. And, you know, you, you look at that and uh, I, I've seen... You know, I get along with all my my siblings, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. But but you Same, yeah. but you wonder. Uh, it, it it is when you talk to them. It it 
you realize that you have all lived different lives, and, and that's kind of cool when you start comparing notes. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I was talking to, so I have one child, which is, you know, that's the number that I always wanted. But I was talking to some parent who I think had, yeah, it was a parent of two. Yeah. And I said something like, you know what, I, I just really admire how you get two out the door instead of one. Like, that's impressive. And <laughs> somehow the, the conversation. Yeah, exactly. The conversation led to a point where she said kind of offhandedly, well, but you know, of course you're a completely different parent with your second than you are with your first. And that was such a clarifying moment for me because I, you know, something I've thought about a lot is what you just alluded to, which is that five siblings have five completely different childhoods, which shouldn't make sure. sense. But, you know, of course their parents are different people when each child is born, just as experience accrues over time. Yeah, they get older, they get more experience, yeah. they they mature, and mm -hmm. their lot in life may have improved greatly or, or the opposite. Yeah, exactly. It could go either way. Yeah, exactly. Um, you're four years old. Is that how old? Uh, she's six now. Oh, she she's was six four, now. Yeah, she was four at the beginning of the pandemic. So six years old. Um, it sounds, and I don't know this, but it sounds like you're at a soccer game right now. <laughs> you know what? I live across the street from a school. <laughs> and, uh, it's one of those New York City schools with like the giant echoing three walled courtyard out front. Oh, okay. So All right. There is a burst of noise around <laughs> lunch hour and recess. It's, I don't mind it because it's happy noise, but I've got a really good microphone that picks up everything. No, it's it's fantastic. It sounds really cool. And a lot good. of times when we when we do this with authors, you hear birds chirping and you uh, you'll hear their dog, and you know suddenly I'm I feel like I'm courtside, and it's very cool. Yeah, I good. Like good. it a, a great deal. Emily St. John Mandel's new novel is Sea of Tranquility. It is published by Kanaf. Emily, I thank you so much for being with us and for sharing about this beautiful novel. I'm such a fan of your work, and I'm so grateful that you spent time with us today. Thank you well, so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Again, the name of the new novel is Sea of Tranquility. It is published by Knopf. We enjoy hearing from our listeners about our shows. You can email us at book at wamc.org. You can listen again to this or find past book shows via podcast or at wamc.org. Sarah LaDuke produces our program, Book Marcus for next week, and thanks again for listening. For The Book Show, I'm Joe Donahue.